been the last time I, I, I think we sort of ended up um, as uh, the, shall we say, um, Spain and France, if you will, as, as Christian um, uh, countries now were becoming Christian countries and um, had coalesced around Christianity to, to drive Islam out of Europe. I mean, they've been bottled up by Islam first, I think, on the East, you know, in terms of um, uh, the rise of Islam in, in, in uh, 600 AD, etc., and its conquest uh, through the Eastern part of Europe, if you will, up into Russia, etc., and also into India. And then its movement across North Africa, and then into Spain, and, and uh, Portugal, and to some extent into France. So Europe had been bottled up. The, the Visigoths had been defeated. But over time, um, internal problems um, in terms of the, the Moors or the Arabs and the, the, the different empires that, that came and went that were Muslim empires, the Almoravids and the Almohads, et cetera, et cetera, leading, um, shall we say, to, to defeat of, of, the, of the Moorish Arabs in 1492, pretty much for that battle of Kuwait, I think it's called, and the driving of, you know, so many um, Muslims and Jews um, out of um, Spain and Portugal, because the Jewish population had lived very well, and the Christian population had lived very well together under the Moorish Arabs. Um, so we're entering a new phase. Uh, can, can, we, can you paint that for us in terms of the rise of Christianity and, and now it, it begins to, to move out of Europe, um, especially in terms of its movement around the African coast and in terms of being a trading and a navigator and, and wanting to get away from that blockade on the east by Byzantium, et cetera, um, which, which the Crusades um, you know, uh, uh, could not penetrate and now wanting to get a trade route around Africa. And this now begins an expansion of Europe. Greetings. My name is Robin Walker. I'm also known as the Black History Man. I am perhaps best known for my 2006 book, When We Ruled. Based on this book, I'm launching a new online history course aimed at you, the adults. You could be a parent, you could be a teacher, a mechanic, cleaner, professionals, care workers, security guards, taxi drivers, kitchen workers, entrepreneurs, tech heads, lawyers, all of you. We want people from all over the world to be empowered by our content. We want you to gain mastery over your history and heritage. And you can do this by subscribing to our course. Click on the link to get this powerful, life-changing material. Yeah, the beginnings of the expansion of Europe are um, essentially the two countries that the Moors and the Arabs had the biggest impact in was Spain and Portugal. And these two countries were now going to begin a golden age of Europe through exploration, through conquest, and through genocide. Now, what happens somewhere around the year 1441 we get a very, very important slave raid against North Africa. And it's led by a Portuguese mariner called Antam Gonçalves. And that slave raid, uh, he sailed to the coast of Southern Morocco, saw some Africans on the coast and kidnapped them, and then brought them back to Europe. Others ended up in the islands off the coast of Africa, Madeira, Canaries, those kind of places. Because, of course, you've got to remember, Europe didn't know the Americas existed yet. And so the beginnings of what's going to become transatlantic enslavement was just hit and run raids by Portuguese people uh, sailing around the coast of Africa. Starts in um, South Morocco, then they get a bit further down to where the Gambia is, then they get a bit further down. And essentially, they're organizing hit and run raids. Can you, can you back up a, 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 a little bit, Robin, because 
um, the, the, the etymology, shall we say, of, of the word slaves comes from Slavs. And, and, and the Slavs were slaves during that um, Moorish um, Arab um, uh, period of conquest of, of um, Europe, or if you will, Spain and Portugal. And they became sort of a high value in those slaves from the, the Northeast, shall we say, of Europe, the Slavs. Um, they became, in a sense, prized possessions. And in some sense, they diluted the population of the Moors, because again, the Moors and Arabs were Muslims, and they were allowed to have more than one wife. So these women were apparently attractive, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that, I think that's the way the word slave came into the vocabulary. And, and, and that um, in breeding, shall we say, also, you know, I've changed the face of what came to be to be more in Spain because many of us who go to Spain and say, "Well, gee, you know, where's the, the evidence of the Moors?" But a lot of that was diluted by the the Slavs or the slaves who were intermarrying into the population at the time. I just wanted to bring that that point out as you get into that whole business of the concept of slavery, because the concept of slavery in terms of Europe, began with the Slavs, not with the Africans. Is that correct? Um, it's complicated because uh -huh. it's a complicated story. <laughs> and if you speak to Eastern Europeans, uh, they do indeed blame us for them being in slavery. Uh -huh. But it wasn't really us. It was the Turks that did that. It wasn't really the Moors. It was the Turks that did that. Now, uh -huh. were there Africans in the Turkish armies? Yes. And of course, in the Eastern European world, they remember that. So their beef with us is over that. But yeah, certainly um, in Moorish Spain, there, were, uh, there was intermarriage between Africans and Goths. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily Slavs, but more Goths. Slavs would have been more Eastern Europe. And yes, you're right, certainly um, captured Slavic people did end up in the Arab world. And one of the changes that that created is a lot of people that call themselves Arabs today are in fact Slavs. Mm. Yeah, um, again, you're not gonna get any Arab historian that's gonna admit that, but that, those are the facts. Mm. So they brought in so, and what then happened was of course, is as slavery in the Arab world took on more and more of a racist nature, they um, intermarried with the Slavs, but then tried to keep us down during that period as well. So that's how you end up with black people at the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, lighter skinned people at the top, and the people at the very top are actually near white. Mm -hmm. And how you end up with a situation like that is essentially the differential treatment of the Slavs over generations compared to the different uh, our, our treatment of Blacks over generations. Mm -hmm. And that's how you will end up with a situation like that. So yes, you're absolutely right. In, in um, places like Egypt, places like Arabia, places like the Middle East, a lot of people that classify themselves as Arabs are in fact Slavs. I, I think that's important to, um, to, to note um, because as we, as we come forward, in terms of history up to the present, um, a, a, a lot of Africans, if you will, Blacks, if you will, call themselves Arabs. I mean, if you look at Sudan uh, today, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, you know, everybody there calls themselves Arab. And you look at them, they look like you and I. And um, so the question is, who or what is an Arab? Is it somebody that speaks Arabic? Does it have something to do with DNA or ethnicity? Or it's a complicated it's story. Linguistic. Uh, let, let me give you an anecdote to do with that. Okay. Um, I was invited by there's a gentleman in South Africa called, called Baba Buntu, and he arranged for me to speak in Oslo, of all places, in Norway. And what happened was I was invited to give a lecture, and then straight after that. Um, an Arabic looking gentleman stood up after me to also give a lecture. And the Arabic looking gentleman explained that he's not actually Arab, he's Nubian. 
And he was arguing that um, uh, people in Sudan should stop using genealogy for history and should start using history as history. Now, from a genealogical perspective, you're de if you're descended from an Arab, you're classified as Arab. Mm -hmm. That's why you end up with black populations being classified as Arab, because if you've got an Arab ancestor, that allows you to claim Arab ancestry. And so in other words, I'm looking at this person and I'm expecting pure rubbish to come out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, the scholar came hard. And what he was arguing was, Sudanese people should stop using genealogy. Not only that, they should embrace their blackness. And he was trying to facilitate the resurrection of the medieval Sudanese language, Old Nubian. Mm -hmm. And he published a book where you've got Old Nubian and Arabic. So an Arabic speaker could facilitate learning Old Nubian. And the other, the, part, the other part of the book was Old Nubian English. So an English Sudanese speaker could facilitate learning Old Nubian. And he wanted to get the Arabicized Sudanese to embrace their blackness, to embrace being you know, descended from ancient Kush, mm -hmm. descended from medieval Makuria, al Nobadia. Mm -hmm. And not only did he give this presentation, her Excellency, the ambassador, uh, the Sudanese ambassador, who again would have classified herself as Arab. He said that in front of her. Now she tried to challenge him and he was very diplomatic in trying to tell her, listen, you're not an Arab, you're black. <laughs> and it was a really interesting thing because, you know, I prejudged this guy. I thought he's not going to be saying anything. Mm -hmm. And the result was he actually came harder than almost anybody. You know, so the Sudanese issue and are Sudanese people blacks or are they Arabs? It's a complicated question, but there are people who you might think would classify themselves as Arab and they're saying, uh, 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 we're black. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that they're stepping with it. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. And it's, it's one of the problems that um, Africa is going to have to solve in, in yeah. terms of it, its history. And, and where we are as Africans at the present time in, in terms of um, claiming a, a, a geopolitical uh, place at, at the table of, of nations. We're going to have to solve that whole Christian, Muslim, traditional African, what is an African? Uh, and we, we'll get back to that because I think it's very interesting, as you say, it has many dimensions. But let's get back to Henry the Navigator, maybe, and, and, and then now the second rise of Europe as they begin to trade, shall we say, around the coast of Africa after they have pushed um, the, the, the Moors and, and Arabs um, out of um, uh, Spain and Portugal. And, and, and the Portuguese were the original ones, shall we say, I think, who were, began to, to do the, the navigating. And, and they gradually came around the coast um, to, to Senegal, and then maybe down to Benin, and then maybe down to Congo, um, you know, and, and it, because I think they were looking to try to get around the Cape of Good Hope and, and to avoid that, that, that whole blockade by, by the Muslim Byzantine Empire, et cetera, et cetera. Can you take us through that now? Yeah. No. Um... The Portuguese were essentially organizing hit and run raids. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't organized mass enslavement. It see some people snatch them. But the Portuguese in doing that, one of the unintended consequences is we do have very detailed Portuguese accounts of Africa. Mm -hmm. So we have um, the Portuguese swap diplomatic envoys with the empire of Benin on a modern map where Nigeria is today. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of detailed information that then comes out through bit from Portuguese sources on the empire of Benin. Uh, before they got to Benin, as you say, they got to the Gambia region. I can't think of a Portuguese chronicle from Gambia, but certainly Benin, yes. Then you've got the accounts of places like the Ashanti. Well, it's not the Ashanti Empire then, because it's before that. 
in the Ghana region. We've got Portuguese accounts there. Then you've got further down, you come to places like Congo and places like Ndongo and Matamba. This is where Queen and Zinga's from. And there's Portuguese accounts there. Then we get as far as the Cape of Good Hope, um, the southern tip of Africa, and the empire there is Munumutapa. Mm. Most people think Munumutapa is just Zimbabwe. No, the Portuguese are absolutely specific in telling us that Munumutapan authority went all the way down to the tip of South Africa. And people are watching this and you want to source Duarte Barbosa writing in 1517 has this information. And I think then, that's important, uh, brother, because one of the justifications of, um, you, you know, the, the, the immigrants who, who, who came there, you know, you know the, the, the Boers who, who, who are the Dutch and as well as the English, they came back, there was nobody there. The, the territory was not occupied. And therefore, you can't say it was African. They are the original people. And yeah. this shows that that's a lie. Yeah, and so the Portuguese saw Duarte Barbosa makes it clear that that's a lie. And it also makes it clear that a lot of Southern Africans, uh, when I wrote When We Ruled, my co-writer was a Zimbabwean, uh, Fari Ray Supia. A lot of Southern Africans are, are being taught lies about that history. So what they want to do is contain it to Zimbabwe. But Muno Matapa wasn't just Zimbabwe. It's all the way down to the tip of uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Then we have Portuguese accounts of the East African civilization, the Swahilis. And so we learn, for example, that the Swahilis had three, four, and five-story houses from the Portuguese accounts. And then we have a Portuguese account of um, Ethiopia. And that's really interesting because one of the Portuguese friars was shown the city of Lalibela, the city of underground churches. Mm -hmm. And that same friar was worried that people aren't going to believe me when I say this in Portugal. So he, he, he writes this whole passage where he says, you know, I swear I'm telling the truth mm -hmm. about these underground churches. Mm -hmm. And so we, the main point is, um, you could argue that one third of Africa's history is in Portuguese archives. Mm. What the Portuguese tell us about um, what some people call the Bantu civilizations mm. um, is powerful information. It, 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 it changes what we know. And, you know, the kind of thing, so for example, I mentioned the, the multi-story houses in East Africa, the underground churches in Lalibela. Um, when it comes to the empire of Muno Mutapa, we learn from a Portuguese source that they had a system in place that you could almost call social security. If you were blind, if you were maimed, there would be an allowance that the emperor would enforce that you got. You got someone to be your guide. You got someone to carry your stuff from one place to another place. And the deal was any of the kings in any of the different localities that didn't support what the emperor was doing would be punished. So in other words, the entitlement that uh, a blind or a disabled person got um, is superior to what people would get today, relatively speaking. Um, we get accounts of places like Congo. There's certain sketches that have survived. Um, one of the cities in the Congo Empire, by now it's spun out of Congolese control, is a city called Loanga. And we get European sources where you've got reproductions of what these cities look like and the grandeur and the splendor. So it's very, very important that while the Portuguese, yes, they were slave traders, yes, they did evil stuff. There's tons that we've learned from, about Africa from their sources. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give one example. Um, uh, one of the Portuguese chroniclers was explaining to his people in Portugal what the word uh, uh, munu mutapa means. Uh, you know, that is the derivative of the word mutapa, meaning emperor. Mm. And the Portuguese said that if you're going to put it into a European context, it means the same as Caesar. Mm. Now, just let that sink in. Mm. Let that sink in. 
it means the same as Caesar. So in other words, the same grandeur that you would associate with the ruler of Munamutapa, mm -hmm. European accounts to make it known to their people, you speak of him in the same sense as you speak of Caesar. As a thank you for visiting our website, we are giving you a free copy of our exclusive 100 Black History Facts, which is in fact a taster of our course content. Make sure you leave your email address and we will send it right to you. We hope it inspires you to dig deeper into your history and heritage. Another one that we have, um, the Portuguese talk about swapping envoys with the ruler of Benin. And then the Benin ruler then sent a priest to go across the waters to Portugal. And because the priest was going the, across the waters, the priest was from the priesthood of Olokun. Olokun, the god of water. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Portuguese accounts translate that as Neptune. So what, what have we just learned? The Yoruba deity, the Benin deity, Olokun, is the equivalent of Neptune, is the equivalent of Poseidon. Do you see? So we learn things that um, connections that Europeans would make between their heritage and ours. Mm -hmm. But if you don't read those accounts, you don't learn those things. I think the other thing you get from that is that the, the early contact was, was a contact, if you will, um, between equals. Absolutely. In, in, in terms of trading, and yeah. exchange of goods. And um, um, slavery, in a sense, um, was incidental because that became, was a bit of a norm at that time. Uh, defeated people were used as slaves, etc. And it, it had a different connotation, which takes it back to the slabs um, in Europe that we were talking about initially. It, it did not become uh, a commodity in, in the sense that in which the transatlantic slave trade became you know, a trade in human beings as commodities until when um, maybe um, um, mid 16th century or mid 17th century. Um, You're right. You're right. And, and just to give you a, the kind of thing, you mentioned trade. One yeah. of the things that the Benin Empire traded with Europe was soap. Mm. And they traded so much soap that the people of Portugal banned the importing of Benin soap so that they could protect their own soap industries <laughs> because the Benin soap industry was wiping theirs out. Mm -hmm. And can you see now how we now look at our history and heritage very differently. What we were making soap, mm -hmm. we were trading soap. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that they traded was what's called ivory. Now, the textbooks say ivory. I've actually seen what those ivory pieces were. They were salt cellars. And if you go into the, the British Museum um, and other museums across Europe, there are 800 of these salt cellars. They're about this big, mm -hmm. right? And these salt cellars are made of ivory and they are actually masterworks of, um, of art. Some of the highest works of art from the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Very, very elaborately decorated. And some of these pieces would come from Benin. Some of these pieces would come from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is, the Portuguese would buy them and then sell them on to royal houses in Europe. So it is said that people like Henry VIII would have those types of salt cellars on his table. So mm -hmm. one of the, you know, like um, when it comes to um, um, food, we, if you're eating from bowls and dishes, we call that China mm -hmm. because the stuff is coming from China. What most people didn't don't know is the salt cellars the ladles and so on and so forth would be these masterworks coming from West Africa during mm -hmm. that time period. And if anyone's watching this, Google uh, Benin ivories or mm -hmm. Sapi ivory, Sapi is S-A-P-I, and mm -hmm. be astounded at the quality of those pieces. 
Well, um, if, you know, I'm sure we would be astounded because we, we know about the quality of the Benin sculptures, yeah. which are also encased in, in European museums, et cetera, et cetera. And there's yeah. a big problem about, you know, reclaiming them, you know, for Benin or for, Na for Nigeria. But yeah. again, I think it's worth emphasizing, as you were, that the trade was in, was in gold, it, it was in salt, and it was in these art objects that were derived, um, uh, shall we say, from the skill and, and workmanship uh, of, of the culture of that period. And um, you know, gradually, to some extent, slaves were mixed in, but it, it did not become a, a, a commodity um, until, again, you know, um, maybe early 1600s in, in, in terms yeah. of when it really went into, shall we say, high gear. Right. And yeah, I think that, did, this, did this come about, uh, again, I think because of the musket and, and, and they, they, they now increased weaponry that the Europeans had. Um, because I know also in terms of Southern Africa, in terms of their invasion and their ability to, to advance against the Zulu and the Bantu was because of the Gatling gun. So there was the, the, the musket and then the, the Gatling gun, which allowed a kill ratio, you know, which was extreme, 400 to one, et cetera. But yeah. with the early rifles, um, they were not that accurate. So that was not a big advantage. You could still fight with a sword or a spear because reloading took a long time. But once yeah. technology developed, they had a repeating rifle. Then there became this uh, advantage in, in, in weaponry. And that's when uh, um, um, Europe was able to penetrate further into the hinterland of, of, of Africa and develop the, the slave trade.